Yeah, I'm sorry I missed that too. I really was looking forward to it. And then I got double book, like you said, same thing. Yeah. Okay, so this is the last section. Let me find the right window. I've got like Porto here. I've got our studio over here. It's a busy day. All right, let's yeah. get this thing and I'll share my screen. So for some reason, I don't know why, but it's like there's some alignment issue in, in the uh, in the notes. It's called chapter 21. I'm not going to worry about it. It's actually yeah. chapter 22. I must have skipped something somewhere, but uh, I actually did make some notes just because it was easier for me. Um, now, if I can just find Zoom, there it is. <laughs> One of these windows is Zoom. <laughs> I know yeah, that. Yeah. Here it is. Share. You can share multiple windows. I don't know what that looks like. Anyway. Uh, so this is uh, the last chapter, which is called Advanced Regression and Multi-Level Models. Um, isn't that what it's, it's called? It's 22 in the book, but it's one we're calling. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why. I, didn't, I, right. I went to investigate, but I didn't. It's probably something simple. It's a funny title because it's not really about advanced regression and multi-level models. It's more, the proper test should have been stuff that we didn't cover that you might want to know about. <laughs> That's what it should have been called. <laughs> exactly. Stuff that we didn't cover and we're not going to cover that you should know about. So it's a relatively straightforward chapter to go through. I do have two, I did work through two of the demos that he did and tied it with the, I didn't work through them, but I copied, I downloaded the tidy uh, Ross versions of them, um, tidy regression other stories versions of them. And I thought we could walk through those real quickly just to see mm -hmm. them work as for fun. Um, so, but the main learning objective today is just simply to, it's just an introduction to know about other models that aren't covered in detail in this book at all. Uh, he starts out with uh, I just a, a review of what the models we have uh, covered so far look like. They're all basically this form, this basic model, uh, y equals x beta plus epsilon, where x could be a potentially large matrix but um, of different predictors. Uh, and there could be other things like, um, you know, uh, link functions and whatnot. But that's the basic mm -hmm. idea, right? Uh, so we can use maximum likelihood for point decimation using this model. We can uh, it's, we can do a lot with this model, basically. Right? We can first of all we can just do maximum likelihood, like a traditional method. Uh, we can include priors as kind of a regularization and use Bayesian methods, and still we can get a uh, you know an estimate there. But also when we do the Bayesian, we can get samples of the posterior, which gives us some ideas about the uncertainty, right? Folding in our prior information as well. Um, we can do forecasting with this model, including an uncertainty, right, in the predictions. We learned how to do that. And we also learned about how to add in nonlinear models, as long as they're additive models, that is, as long as they can be expressed as linear parameters. The model, they, they can be a nonlinear function of the predictors, for example, right? Like polynomials is the simple case, but you can also use other things. Um, let's see, then he talks a little bit about incomplete data, reminds us that we did learn about imputing missing data, some techniques for doing that in chapter 17, but there are other types of incomplete data. We talked about it actually at the time, I remember, um, survival analysis is one big one, right, and censoring, mm -hmm. that's something that's covered in uh, very well, I thought, in the introduction for statistical learning yeah. book. Um, and yeah, that's its own thing, man, it's like, it's hard to cover that just kind of on the yeah, floor, I mean, it's like, yeah. Yeah, you need to do a whole course on just survival. That's true. I think a lot of these things, you'll, I, I will actually I agree with you. A lot of these topics they talked about, just you know, each one of them, um, you know, has produced books, right? <laughs> yeah, no, you need to. Yeah. Uh, errors, uh, another type of incomplete data is measurement error. Uh, there's errors in the measurements of the Y, the outcomes, that's relatively straightforward to fold into the error term. But if there's errors in the Xs, which there are always, right? So often, I guess we just assume they're small, but... Um, that can be more challenging to, to deal with. And he gives a quick example when there's an exercise, which I didn't do, that shows why if you just ignore this, it doesn't work. Um, yeah. But um, in any event, there are techniques for doing that. And he gives some references for that without discussing it any further. The next thing he doesn't discuss very much detail is correlated errors. So correlated errors is something we, we always assume basically that errors are uncorrelated, right? The, uh, that is, each measurement is, un, is independent of every other measurement, right, of the outcomes. And, but you can generalize the regression models in this, that he's covered to include this kind of thing. And examples where you might want to do this are like time series analysis, spatial analysis with spatial correlation, uh, graphs or networks as they are often called, right? Uh, as a whole field, that's definitely a whole field by itself, right, graph machine learning. Um, well, I'll say mixed effects or multi-level models too. I mean, those are right. That's yeah. I think what he means here when he says like factor analysis, but that's, uh, yeah, multi-level models. Yeah, uh, multi-level models. Like we talked, I think we talked about this like an example of like you know students within classrooms within 
right yeah. schools within districts i mean it's like you can nest you have nested structures that are obviously correlated that you have to account for that correlational structure i think but as you were saying before each of these topics certainly has inspired like i said here inspired textbook length oh, yeah. treatments <laughs> for sure and time series is one of the ones like i want to get into i just i keep it's on my list but not yeah, no, I, list, yeah. I, i've done a little dabbling it's it's me it's too but yeah i just dabble the next uh kind of issue or generalization is well not really general this is more an issue of having many predictors and this is something that does happen in the kind of regression that you probably do where you have a large number of predictors because you're trying to control for everything or to make ignorability more plausible in your effects analysis, um, right? That's one example. Um, and so the challenge here is to avoid uh, overfitting essentially, right? Because you're gonna, a lot of, if you have a lot of predictors, you're gonna have a lot of variance, right? In your um, outcome, bigger errors. He says, um, the obvious solution is to reduce the parameters, <laughs> make sure you really need all of them, right? Some of the parameters you can probably eliminate, right? After you've done your first fit, like, well, this parameter didn't really do anything but add noise, so let's get rid of that one um, kind of thing, which I'm sure people do. Uh, another way when you can't do that, if you need all those parameters for some reason, you can consider combining them. He talks about like, maybe you can just add together a bunch of things to make an overall economic. You can also do PCA on like, you can do principal component analysis. Right. That's I, I, I personally don't love that idea just because then it's like, you just have these big glumps of yeah. variants that are like a bunch of things, but you know, some people will like carry into that. And then he also mentions regularization using informative priors, which we've, we've talked about, but also there's something he mentioned briefly in chapter 11, which I actually don't remember, something called a horse. I don't remember that either. Lasso was regular. very hot. That lasso and regularization are a very hot topic. Yeah. And then he lastly mentions lasso, which is, as you know, this absolute value uh, regularizer that tends yeah. to eliminate, bring uh, variables to zero, parameters, uh, coefficients on parameters to zero, and then can reduce your. Uh, unwieldiness of the parameter space. So that was that, again, this, this, these topics are also covered. Some of this is covered well in ISLR too, as well, Instruction Statistical Learning uh, edition, second edition covers the last. So on these regularization things quite well, I thought. Not from a Bayesian perspective, but you know, they're covered. Um, and actually now I just, I just paused and think, wait, how do you properly include a lasso in a Bayesian model? I don't know. I'm not no, sure. No but, clue. Yeah. In any event, um, that's the end of that part. <laughs> Moving right along. We'll get to the, uh, uh, slow, I'm going to slow down a little bit here when we get to the uh, the nonlinear model. So I did want to bring that example in because I think it's pretty cool. Even if we can't understand everything that's going on, it's nice that it works, right? But yeah. first, the uh, multi level and hierarchical models, as we know, is uh, one that's of Galvan's. Yeah. This is, what's interesting is this is Galvan's like, thing, right? I mean, multi-level models, this is like his big thing. He's written a lot of papers on this. And uh, this whole book doesn't really talk about it much, but he does have um, the old book, which does discuss his older book. But his older book, this is meant to be an update to that older book. And he mentions that there is a follow, another a volume two, not in this book, but he mentions on his website. That's what this link leads to. Can I link to it? Okay. Um, applied regression and multi-level models, but it says, you know, expected to be out sometimes in late 2020. So I don't know what happened to that, um, that volume. <laughs> uh, it seems to be stalled. I, I didn't, he, a lot of the principal players aren't on Twitter anymore. They're all on like, what do you call the other thing? Um, oh, um, Mastodon. Mastodon. And I don't really want to mess with that because I mean, I don't. Have now there's, now of course there's, there's threads. Yeah, I just saw that this morning. Um, I didn't want to like set Mastodon seems kind of like a weird, like you have like many accounts everywhere. And I'm like, ah, I don't really want to deal with it. Well, it's like open source. It's, a, so it's, yeah. open, it's open source. So I think, yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it's never going to. Yeah. So anyway, the point that was that book is not available yet, but there are Bayes rules. For example, remember Bayes rules did cover at some level, multi-level uh, hierarchical models, right? We did do that in that course. Mm -hmm. And also Bayesian data analysis, Galwan's big Bible book, um, this thing. Right, hmm. um, this big book, which is available okay. free online, it's really a reference, not a bomb dam damage assessment. No, uh, it's, uh, it's yeah, uh, it's available online, but I got it. It's a very good reference. It's terrible to learn things from because, as far as I can tell, I don't know if it's meant to be something yeah. to learn from, but it's not really. But it's a great reference and it does cover in detail all kinds of interesting things, including variational techniques, etc. In that book. 
Uh, oh, I didn't cover the first bullet. He does make a quick point that, you know, if uh, it can also just, you can just, you can do a quick and dirty as it were, multi-level model as it were, uh, not being multi-level, just including the factor, uh, along the regression coefficient essentially to vary by group. Um, that's just, you know, doing like, an, uh, that's a straightforward way to uh, do a sort of quasi multi-level thing without, mm -hmm. um, without using proper multi-level techniques. But if you do use multi-level, you, you mentioned that's fine. We have lots of data, but often the number of observations per group is small. And so you can partially pool the varying coefficients. Remember that partial pooling thing from Bayes rules and that it can improve the uh, statistics, right? By doing mm -hmm. that, by basically by putting in the model, the fact that these groups are associated with each other and there should be some influence of the coefficients between the different groups, that partial pooling effect. Anyway, this is again, this is something not covered in this book. But if you need to know about it, you should, yeah. I, I would probably reopen Bayes rules, remind myself about how it works. I haven't done yeah. it in a while, so it's been a while. Another book I didn't put on here that you just remind me is the Puppy Book. Um, also covers this in a lot of detail. The what remember. book? The Puppy Book. What's it actually called? Hang on. The Puppy <laughs> Book. Yeah, it's an older book, not that old, but um, it's got puppies on the cover. That's why I called that. Mm. Bayesian Data Analysis: A Tutorial in R with R Jags and Stan. Mm. So it was the second edition was published in 2014, which is like forever ago in this field, yeah. but it's really well written. Uh, it's just unfortunate that the code, I don't know if it even works anymore. Maybe somebody's kept up to date, I don't know. Anyway, it's another one that covers multi-level in, in some detail. But yeah, it's R, but it uses yeah. Jags a lot, and then only later does it use Stan. I don't even, don't even Jags as you get that running anymore. I'll link it anyway. Hmm. It's one of the first books I ever did work through this stuff in. And first one, the first book whose content I forgot. <laughs> yeah, another feeling. I would put it in the chat if I can find the Stephen Zoom thingy. That's not Zoom, that's... There it is. Uh, this is the Amazon link, apologies to the... Uh, okay. I'm sure it's, there's other links better than that, but just so you know what I'm talking about, I probably would not buy it from Amazon because Amazon doesn't treat their books very well these days. They used to be a bookstore, now they're like a junk store, and <laughs> when you buy books, they just throw them in a bag and throw them on your door. <laughs> Half yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I digress. Nonlinear models. Uh, so often you have nonlinear models. You, these are like inspired. These models are usually inspired by detailed knowledge of what the system you're modeling is, right? And in that case, the model might be some physics-based model or some biology or science-based model, and they are almost never linear, right? <laughs> um, and in that case, uh, you can't use linear regression, but you can still use regression. And Stan can handle these things just fine, which is kind of cool. Which is actually one of the really one of the reasons why I originally investigated uh, Bayesian modeling was because I had nonlinear models. I wanted to understand if you ever tried to fit nonlinear models with uh, traditional statistics, um, you will probably go crazy trying to understand the errors. There's a lot of uh, because I was trying to understand the errors on the coefficients, and it's really hard to understand what the heck they're saying. Anyway, yeah. I digress again. We are going to look at a demo, the golf demo, which is pretty cool. Um, he also, uh, this is actually a well-known uh, demo from Gelman. I forgot I was going to look it up and post the blog. You can search. Are you pronouncing it Gelman? Is that how you say it? It's Gelman, I think. Gelman. There's a physicist named Gelman. That's why I keep getting confused. In other words, it's just funny. <laughs> I was Murray <laughs> Murray Gelman is a very famous physicist, and yeah, I think it's just Gelman, but I could Gelman. Be Sorry to. Uh, all right. Both, to both the physicist and the statistician for, uh, <laughs> for that. But in any event, um, there, he has some blog posts about this, which you can Google about this golf example. It's like a nice little, oh, no, not a, not a, uh, not a uh, blog post. Well, it's on the stand documentation as an example of, uh, um, of, of using stand to do nonlinear models, essentially a vignette, so to speak. So let me pull that up. Come on, computer. New share. Oh, I gotta. Let me just stop share for a minute. I get my brain sorted out. This is why I talk fast, so that when I screw up, I have a minute to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. I have too many things open. It's a big mistake. Okay, so now I gotta regression of stories. Tidy Ross. 
go. Yeah, what's going on here? Oh, I'm, I'm running the Tidy Ross project right now. That's weird. I didn't realize that. Good. That makes it easier. Um, so this, I'm just going to sh share that our studio, I mean, it could be knitted, but then you can't actually work through it, right? The Now, of course, the version he does in the stand um, documentation doesn't use tidy, tidy verse, so. This, this example does. Wow, I'm having a day with the Zoom today. Where's the thing? Let's we share screens. There it is. Sorry for the delay. Okay, so can you see my R Studio now? Um, yeah. Okay, let me get rid of that side of it anyway. So this is. Um, that's the other one we're gonna do, scalability. So this is uh, an example of, do you remember this from the book, The Golf Shot? So the idea is he has a bunch of measurements of a guy doing putting uh, and then how often they miss essentially, right? Right. And so let's just run this, hopefully it works. Yay. And let's plot it, oh, sorry, plot, no. Nope. So that's just the data we're gonna read it in. Uh, so the table, the data looks like is a bunch of uh, distances for the shot, and then the number of shots are, that were, were attempted at that distance, and the number that went in. That's it, right? I don't know what this. Wait a is. minute. So like from two yards, oh, these are putts, right? Oh, okay. Putts, yeah, putts. I don't know if it's yards. These are, these are feet. In feet. Yeah. Okay. I think it's feet. Oh, feet. Yeah, putt distance and feet. Right. This standard error of y over n for whatever reason we don't really care about that. Um, so. Why isn't it y over the square root of n? Well, y over n is the um, probability, right? Or the fraction that went in. Oh, okay. But yeah, isn't the standard error usually, you, don't you think the square root of the... Um... Yeah, there's a square root of, in calculating this number. Um, mm. But the, it's the square root of, y, of, of the quantity y over n. But, I mean, that's where it's the probability, it's the standard error of the quantity y over n, which is mm. not shown here. Anyway, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Here's a figure. You saw that in the book as well. Do we need this lower window down here? Not really. Um, this is distance to the hole of feet. These are the show oh, that I see the these uh, error bars come from that. That's where that comes from. And these are the uh, probabilities of getting it in as a function of distance. So first thing to try, well, it's probability versus something logistic regression, right? So that's what he does first using Stan GLM. Um, straightforward, right? Um, I guess I've never seen this particular way of doing it before, though. So he builds up this little model object and then passes that in. I didn't know you can do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. And that's not what's happening. He's just calling Stan GLM. I was confused. This is just a print function. No. So he's just calling. Here's the, here's the, here's the model. Here's the uh, family logic. Here's the data golf. Pretty straightforward. We've done that a million times. Yep. Does it fit? And he finds this uh, intercept uh, minus 0.26 uh, log odds, I guess, per foot. Um, with the standard deviation 0.01, and not really. Yeah, so what is X again? Sorry. Oh, you're going to show me. X is a feet. But let's look at a plot of that, and this is what it looks like as a plot, right? So it's not terrible. It's obviously missing something important, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, this is what you might do if you didn't know anything else about golf. You know, somebody just gave you this data, right? This is kind of like the, um, uh, you know, just a straightforward approach. I was going to say the machine learning approach, but I don't, I don't really mean yeah, that. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, there is, like, I, think there, I don't know if this is still true, but like uh, I read somewhere years ago that like even PGA professionals only make like 60 or 50% of all putts within like six or five feet or something like that. And that's kind of borne out here. Yeah, that seems consistent. I'm not sure what this data is from, but. Um, I forgot actually. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's one person or just a collection. I think it might have to be a collection. There's too many, like too many attempts. Yeah. It must be like from a whole bunch of professional golfers because you didn't have one guy stand there and try a thousand times. I mean, it would require a lot of beer then it would affect your <laughs> outcomes. <laughs> right. right. So the next thing he does, what, what is this? Can we just do that? Oh no, let's see how we can do that. 
So now it comes the fun part. Um, okay, first fun part is we're gonna re-express this same exact model in the language of Stan. Now Stan is its own language, right? Probabilistic programming language for expressing these kind of models. And it has its own way of doing things and its own documentation and everything else that you can read about. Um, and it's worth probably if you ever end, end up having to do a lot of uh, in more complicated models where you can't take advantage of these things like Stan GLM, um, where it already packages, basically Stan GLM puts these files together for you and then runs the compilation and then does all behind the scenes, right? That's what that actually does. But you can actually use our Stan directly to make your own Stan files, uh, which are compiled by Stan into little executables. So this is how this model looks if you write it in Stan. So there's a lot of boilerplate because Stan is, requires you to tell you the type of everything. Say, so okay, the number of, uh, I guess he used N here. So the book used J here, which is kind of, N is the number of distances, it turns out, right? Um, so the number of items and a number of rows, I guess, in our data set. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, X is the distance for that row. Uh, N is the number of attempts and Y. So this is not telling you what the data is. This is telling you what the types of those things are. It's just saying that this is a vector. These are integers, okay? Um, and it's telling us furthermore that there's two parameters, the slope and the intercept. They're called A and B. But right now, I'm not telling you what anything else besides the fact that they're real. But these are parameters that you're going to fit, right? And then mm -hmm. finally, you give it the model, which looks kind of familiar, right? It's like this formula syntax, y is binomial logic of uh, n mm -hmm. attempts. This is the number of attempts, and this is the number of success, model number of successes at each distance, right? So that's what we got to fit. Um, and so this just, you know, not, don't pay too much attention to this, but you have to like put the data in a particular format that Stan likes. It has to be a list like, a list like this. And then, so if you, oh, I didn't actually run any of this. I mean, there are R packages that you can do this, but you don't have to, it will translate this for you, right? Yeah, like Stan GLM, exactly right. Yeah. Right, so in fact, we just did that. This is, we're just redoing the same thing we just did up here, right? So this, this right here, effectively behind the scenes does this. Okay. That's what I'm, that's the point of this. Um, so we have to, so by hand though, we can translate, not by hand, but um, for Stan, we can translate into its format and then run the Stan, model now we're ring stand telling it this is where the code is the code is in a string we're giving it a string of code the data and telling it to fit it and it's still an r though i think because you see here on like it's it still says r in the upper part in the in the chunk uh descriptors you know message equals false so it's still running r code yeah so it's still running r code but behind the scenes is compiling it's just calling stan and compiling this thing um This one doesn't have that. Is it still running? No, it's done. I'm just looking for something else. So, all right. So it's done running. Uh, and then we can look at the result. And yeah, it's the same kind of, it's basically the same. Well, we can actually do that. He does comparison here. Well, how do the coefficients compare? Um, they're basically the same, right? Wait, they're not even close to being the same. What happened here? Oh, yeah. What the heck is going on? They were close when I read it before. I'm confused about something. Well, I mean, first of all, it's like you have A to the mean. One is um, the different? first two lines are for the mean of the intercept. Yeah, they're, they should be different because the last two are for the standard deviation. First two are for oh, the Oh, these are the differences. I thought these were just going to be a table of them. These are the differences. So they're very close. <laughs> okay, never mind. These are the differences in the means and the differences in the standard deviation. Remember, the scale of these things are... 2.2 for the uh, intercepts and 0.25 for the um, for the slope. So the differences in the slopes, uh, which are the second and fourth row, is negligible basically, right? So they fit, they get the same results as they should because basically it is actually doing this. I'm surprised they're not exactly the same. Probably just you know uh, we didn't see it in the same way or whatever, right? Because there is a stochastic process involved in generating these, um, right? The the Monte Carlo Markov chain, right? So, so they're basically the same, all right? Uh, now, this is the thing we don't have a tool for, and that is a nonlinear model. But in Stan, we can just do the same thing. Now, so I didn't, I'm not, not in here is his discussion of how he generates a nonlinear model. But the assumption is we're gonna think about the physics that's involved. When the golfer is golfing, um, we're gonna assume that he has a basically a normal distribution in the angle of the shot, right? He's trying to hit it toward the hole, but there's some error, and we're gonna say it's in the angle, 
there's a uh, normal distribution of some unknown sigma. That's going to be our only one, one and only parameter, what the sigma is on that, uh, which is cool, right? So this is all going to reduce down to a single parameter. What's sigma, right? Nothing else about distance, nothing else about knowing anything, just what's sigma, right? What's the error? Uh, what's the error range for golfers on average, I guess, right? And but in the same way as we did the linear model, we can now do we can you know same thing. We have now we have there's our parameter. So here's our parameter sigma, right? This is just a this radius uh, difference is just a constant, right? The difference in the radius between the hole and the ball, right? This goes into just goes into this equation which he derives in the book. I'm not going to cover it, but the point is you just write it out. Say this is what it is. This is the model. It's nonlinear. It doesn't matter. Stan doesn't care. You can put put anything here, right? Long as as long as it can be uh, calculated, you can go in there <laughs> essentially, right? Now, of right. course, you have to be careful with all these kind of things because it's a stochastic process. And if, you know, the numbers get out of range or get, you know, you, you can have numerical issues, numerical stability issues, which you have to like test for. And this is where it gets challenging. I've, I've run into this myself with my own Bayesian things before where I run into like, oh, things aren't working. It's usually because, you know, sometimes it's as simple as just normalizing the data, rescaling it. Sometimes it requires being more careful with the model to handle edge cases or something, but it can be done, right? In this case, this very simple model which it really is simple, <laughs> you know, other than the fact you have to know something about Stan to write something like this, but that's something yeah. to do, right? Um, it's, you know, just a few lines, it's really only this line, right? <laughs> that's it, <laughs> right? Um, and I mean, I'm guessing that if you really had to, you could probably like copy paste something like this and figure out what you might have to put in there to get something like this. But anyway, um, maybe not, but we fit it the same way. Right, call Stan and it'll crank through. It'll take a minute, like it did before. But the only parameter is sigma. So we'll see what sigma turns out to be. As it finishes running. I don't know about you, but I just think that's pretty cool, right? What, that, that it, it, you can just run it in Stan? Or that, what do you mean? That, uh, yeah, that you could do things like this. So you have this, before you had this slope and intercept model, they're really hard to interpret. What does it mean? Here we have, a, we've created this nonlinear model, which has a very easy to interpret single parameter and it fits really well, right? Uh, it's, you know, so there's a sigma, the uh, angle error of a golfer is 0 0.026 uh, with standard deviation of like 0.004. It's pretty nice uh, fit, right? And we can see that if we plot it. So now, Here's the logistic regression, which is terrible. Here's this geometry-based model, which is, it's not perfect, but it's a much better fit, right? It's much more, yeah. and, and it's a single number that's involved. He's printed, he, he plotted it for the median, I think he said, but he said, it doesn't actually matter because the, the error is so small. You can plot the, you know, the mean the slope, or you can plot the range of them. You won't, you won't mm. make this line a little thicker. So it's, anyway, that's a pretty nice result. Yeah. And it's like the canonical uh, Stan nonlinear example, apparently, in the, uh, in the Stan thingy. So that's one. How are we doing on time? Fantastic. You're fine. Um, what is this? I can share my iPhone somehow from my computer? That's weird. Sorry, I'm distracting myself. <laughs> uh, OK, back to the, back to the um, notes. So that was that. Uh, now, the next kind of topic he talks about is non-parametric regression and machine learning. And of course, this is all the hype these days, as you know. Um, yeah. Machine learning everywhere, as uh, uh, Buzz Lightyear is telling us in the little <laughs> meme there. Uh, so what does this mean? Non-parametric regression is a regression where the curve is not constrained by any kind of parametric form. That's kind of obvious, right? So it's just some kind of non, it's non-parametric. It's kind of obvious, right? Uh, machine learning, he says, describes a form of non-parametric regression where the goal or the focus is more on prediction rather than on parameter estimation, okay? Um, so in those cases, so instead of trying to understand relationships between variables, we're trying to, we don't really care about that. We just want to be able to predict future values given, path, given new, new values, right? And so the whole approach is, is often different, although there is a lot of overlap between machine learning and uh, regression, obviously, but... Um, it's really, it's really a question of focus, right? I really more care about predicting. I don't care about understanding a model. Um, another way to say that, I think, I was just thinking about this today. Um, there's this paper, um, I'll see this paper right here. <laughs> Statistics versus machine learning. I'll post a link to it. Um, really interesting paper. 
uh, it's biology focused, but the guy really spells out really well the difference between like statistics methods, inference methods versus these machine learning methods and how they overlap and, and uh, work with each yeah. other, uh, complement each other, I guess the word I'm trying to say. Um, but, you know, but in the beginning of the thing, he says statistics draws population inference, inferences from a sample, right? That's kind of the, what we've been doing through this whole book. Whereas machine learning, the focus is on finding generalizable, predictable patterns, right? Predictive patterns. That's how he phrases it in that in that citation there. Let's see if I can get this. Here we go. Let me just post this in chat. I think it's a great little read. Chat, where are you? I can't believe after all this time messing around with these book clubs, I have not at all mastered the Zoom. Uh, world. <laughs> anyway, I got to post it in chat. So there's some more more to read there about and think about in terms of what what is the what is what is machine learning and what is uh, statistical uh, regression? What is statistical learning? Is kind of in between there that type of thing, right? But the approaches are often different, right? Like in statistical in, uh, statistics, we usually fit the whole data, right? And we care about the relationship. We don't like hold out data, but sometimes you do. <laughs> but generally, you don't hold out data. Whereas in machine learning, you're generally have like you do a test validation split, and you're like you try all kinds of different models and, and check on the validation data. And then when you get happy, then you finally check on the test data, right? Uh, that kind of whole approach is a kind of a different kind of mindset generally, but you know, validation is often also used in, in uh, statistics as well. So I, anyway, there's overlap. Uh, I digress a little bit there. I apologize, but I just want to make that point. Yeah. It kind of brushes over a little bit. To, uh, he says one of the issues with these non-parametric models is that they are very flexible and tend to overfit. Um, so they use a lot of techniques to constrain the model rather than constraining it parametrically to constrain it other ways like, um, uh, well, I guess we'll see in some particular examples. Um, some examples are like the uh, local leeway to regression, L-O-E-S-S, -S, which I forgot that stands for now. Well, it's usually, it's, it's local something Regret. So it's usually pronounced Lois. Lois. Okay. Not like the TV, not like the store. <laughs> Lois. Yeah, not like Lois. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's like, um, you, you sort of like are waiting the, the regression at like the, the little points. So it does its best to kind of like follow the, the, the wiggles of the, you know, the line. Yeah. It's usually more useful for like plotting. Right. I think the O is that. I think it's usually, it's not usually something like we're doing for inference. You're doing it for like descriptive. Yeah. yeah. So this actually the name of it explains why you use it. Right. It's called locally estimated scatter plot smoothing. Right. So it's, it's mainly like, that's kind of the main use of it. I think for like just smoothing out a plot, make it look better. Uh, but anyway, it, it's an interesting example because it's very straightforward and simple, uh, non-parametric uh, method. And it's tuned, like you said, it's basically the local regression over the neighboring points and that there's a weight function that determines how important the neighboring points are for each point. And the strength of that weight function is the tuning, right? Of the tuning of how flexible it is. This is that um, hyperparameter we were talking about before. Another couple of methods are splines, which are kind of like nonlinear basis function and the tuning there determines the local smoothness. Uh, Gaussian processes are, I think, um, there's basically a big giant multivariate Gaussian model and the tuning controls the correlation distances and the off diagonal elements, so to speak, uh, between the different elements, right? Uh, then there's tree models, which are very popular, uh, probably the most popular uh, for tabular data and most powerful, arguably the most powerful currently, I think, for tabular data. That you, if you're not trying to do uh, statistics on, if you want to just do predictions, you can't go wrong with something like XGBoost, right? I mean, it almost outperforms every other model on, on tabular data for machine learning purposes, if, again, right? Um, and we learned about those in, uh, in, uh, in introduction of statistical learning, for example. Uh, and then finally, there's a Bayesian uh, version of regression trees, or trees, sorry, called Bayesian Additive Regression Trees, BART, not to be confused with one of the Google language models. And uh, it somehow, I said somehow, because he doesn't really tell us in the thing, and I didn't investigate it myself, but it somehow includes priors over trees Mm. And, leaf, and the leaf values. And he recommends this article and it's uh, by Jennifer Hill, I think, and all. Um, no, I thought Jennifer Hill was in that. No, yeah, Jennifer Hill for sure. Yeah, because remember that thing I linked in the chat um, of Slack? Uh, Jennifer Hill seems to be big, deep on these Bayesian added regression trees, and she uses them as part of her, that casual uh, modeling on that website. 
So this is kind of the, the canonical reference on BART, if you want to learn more about that. And anyway, other than BART, most of these methods or all these methods are covered in the wonderful book, Introduction to Statistical Learning, <laughs> which there is book clubs for here, and I recommend highly. Hmm. Uh, he also talked about meta algorithms. So this is uh, ways to combine together various models. And this is an interesting way of putting it, right? So ensemble learning, this XGBoost is an ensemble method. Uh, Tree-based tree methods are almost always done in an ensemble way, but ensemble learning uh, is a big topic by itself. And there are, like you, like you said before, there's entire books, again, on this topic as well, on ensemble learning. Deep learning, well, you know that's popular right now, but it's really actually a relatively straightforward idea. And the idea in a very abstract way is just, hey, what we're gonna do is combine very simple models, typically linear models, right? Uh, into larger, more flexible models with some nonlinear element-wise things in between them to make them uh, learn new things. And that's it, right? As long as they're differentiable, then we just do a gradient descent to optimize some loss. That's what deep learning is, <laughs> essentially in a very, very short nutshell. But again, that is a topic of big, big books um, out there and very, very popular. So there's lots of books on that. It's not as popular in our in the R world, I think. Um, it seems to be a deep Python. learning. You mean? Yeah, it seems. Yeah, it's, it's like it seems like it seems like there's a lot of bias toward using Python for that. Well, I think primarily that's because the main libraries, PyTorch, Jax, um, TensorFlow, that do this are all Python first, right? I mean, there are there's our version of Torch, but I think it'd be hard to use our Torch because you know to do any of this deep learning stuff is these are big, big uh, data, big problems, big models, and you need GPUs. So you're gonna have to go online to use some cloud GPUs and you know, then you're gonna want to use the Python libraries because much, much easier and less uh, resistance. Um, it's, an, you know, it's an impedance matching problem, so to speak, you say in engineering, the impedance mismatch between R and uh, these deep learning libraries is to my mind too great. Uh, but nevertheless, there might be a Torch, um, R Torch course book club, I mean, starting here on, um, this slack at some point, hopefully not too soon because I might want to get involved in that. I'm not sure I'm still kind of on the fence to tell you the truth because of these issues with the impedance mismatch. I've been doing a lot with these deep learning models recently for my work. So I'm doing a lot of Python right now because of that. I'm yeah. not sure, I, I may just be uh, uh, a waste of time, so to speak. <laughs> not, not, that's not where I work. let's say, not the best use of my time to go back and look at our torch. I don't really see there's anything I'm going to gain from that. Same way, I would never really think on these Python uh, Bayesian libraries. There, there's again a mismatch there, and R is just the way to go. R stand is, is a great uh, tool. So, learn many tools is the rule. Yeah. Wow, that's a really strong tangent. All right. So, what we're we doing here? Oh yeah. So, linear and uh, logistic regression. This is kind of this thing again between like regression versus uh, machine learning. But uh, when you use like Bayesian inference, we can like make strong statements. Uh, but we made strong assumptions, right? We made strong assumptions about the model, uh, and that helps us. The model contains a lot of information in it, basically, right? It contains a lot of it's the priors, but also the model itself is, is, a, is a sort of prior, right? And but this does allow us to summarize small data sets because we've incorporated this information. Uh, machine learning, especially these meta, meta algorithms, they provide very little structure, They're extremely flexible. They don't have a, sometimes called inductive bias is, is relatively low, um, and but they do provide very large flexibility. Uh, but in that case, you really do need to make sure you have a lot of data. That's, and that's what we have. That's why the deep learning revolution has been happening because we have big data, right? Big data, big computing, GPU, uh, server farms. You can crank these things through and, and do useful things as we all have seen, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean there's not a very, very important place though for traditional statistics for the science right <laughs> it's still yeah. important science is still important it's still important uh, okay so the last topic um before we get to the end of the session and of the book is mm -hmm. computational efficiency uh and this is mainly focused on stan now stan uses generally the hybrid it, 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 hamiltonian sorry hybrid <laughs> the hybrid in there. hamiltonian markov uh chain monte carlo um algorithm which what this does is produce we talked about this in Bayes rules didn't we? yeah we sure did yeah we did 
Um, I mean, I, I I don't have a ton of experience with this, so yeah, I'm, that's that's why I brought it up. <laughs> yeah, we did talk about that in Bayes rules and Bayes rules. I think we even implemented a baby version of this. Yeah, uh, um, just using um, Metropolis. Uh, Metropolis, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, gonna, yeah, I gotta go back. Yeah, I gotta yeah. get back into that book. Yeah. Any event, uh, Stan. That's what Stan uses an advanced version of that called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and if Produce, the important point is it's a random walk in the parameter space. It's a, so it's a stochastic, stochastic process, process and also an iterative process. Um, those are important points to keep in mind. So and by default, it, if you just run you know, stand GLM, it produces four parallel chains of 1,000 draws each, give you 4,000 total draws. And it gives you some diagnostics you can look at. And this you may also remember from Bayes rules, right? There's R hat. The R hat tells you how the different chains compare. You want that near one. If uh, the chains are different, too different, that means things haven't really settled down. The chains haven't fully mixed individually. Uh, that's one. That's the reason why you do multiple chains. Uh, and effective is the effective number of samples. So you, you got a thousand draws in each chain, or four thousand total, but um, you don't really have that many independent samples because it's an iterative process. So each sample depends on the previous sample. It's a random walk, and your effective number of samples is always significantly less than that. But he says if you have like a factor of like at least 400, that's generally sufficient for whatever that, I mean, I don't know how he came up with that, but that's what he said usually, yeah. okay, uh, fine. Uh, one way you can perhaps determine that is by looking at your Monte Carlo standard error, which is the additional uncertainty that it computes based due to the fact that it's a stochastic algorithm. And that should be near zero. It has been negligible in all the examples in this book, but that's another statistic. I think N effective and MCSE are kind of complementary uh, in my experience. If uh, N effective is too small, you'll find the MCSE is really big. <laughs> yeah. So those are diagnostics. Uh, now we found ourselves already in this book occasionally when doing exercises that these things can really get slow. Yeah. When the data and when data gets even larger and more complex with lots of predictors, the computation speed can be your limiting factor, right? Um, now one thing you can do is just get bigger computer, <laughs> more computers, more CPUs, and there you can do that to some extent because this is a parallel parallelizable algorithm, right? Each chain is completely independent, so you can run multiple chains on different CPUs, or in the case of uh, your single computer with multiple cores, um, and you can just, there's an option for that. Just say, okay, cores equals parallel detect cores, and it will actually now start running the thing on multiple cores, which is kind of cool. Wow. Uh, in this case, let's speed it by a factor of four, because we did four chains, but you could perhaps, I don't know, there's probably some limit uh, to that, of course, but at least you can get a factor of four speed up that way. And then if you use faster computers, maybe you can do faster. I don't know. There's probably more. He did say in the book that there's more uh, um, research being done to try to find more ways to parallelize this process. Uh, but that's not the only answer. You can also say, OK, I'm not going to use Monte Carlo mock-up channel. All I really care about is good approximation. Uh, there are some good approximations. The simplest one is just to take the uh, maximum um, posterior probability, I call it MAP, I guess. No, I put the, put the A stands for. Is it called MAP when Bayes rule? Do you remember that? MAP, Bayesian. When you do the mean, we said something about the median. Yeah, the would... median, a posterior, the A is A, and a posterior. So it's the maximum, not the median, but the maximum, the peak, um, the mode of the posterior distribution called the MAP. Um, but you can do a little bit better than just getting the maximum. You can also just take the Hessian, the, the second derivative at that point, right? At the maximum. <laughs> so I'm drawing, where's the camera? I'm drawing a little curves. So you go, here's the maximum. Weep, figure out the curves. And then you can put a, a, a Gaussian approximation with that same curvature at that point, right? So you can get some estimate of the parameter uncertainty that way. It's a, it's a rough approximation. But the nice thing about it, it's very, very fast. It's, it's just as fast as doing GLM itself. Um, this is called the, you do this by passing in algorithm equals optimizing into stand in GLM, which I wish I would have known about a long time ago because we could have been using that a lot to just do quick and dirty stuff. Uh, if you read the stand documentation, it recommends not using this for final results, but it's great for exploration, right? Just to put that in there to explore different models and, and see how well they work. Uh, there's other um, methods as well. Variational inference is called, it's a whole big field of finding uh, approximations to the posterior distribution rather than doing Monte Carlo Markov chain. And this uh, turns out to be big business as well because deep learning is uh, starting to use this more and more. I don't know if you've heard of things like uh, generative adversarial networks and things like this, but they use these kind of variational techniques, Bayesian techniques essentially uh, in these deep learning systems now. It's actually very 
interesting and somewhat challenging material to, to learn about as well. You have to learn about the KL divergence and, uh, you know, elbows and a whole bunch of other weird terminology, but <laughs> it's, it's quite a quite a big field. So another textbook, at least, although I haven't actually found a good textbook level of treatment of that, to tell you the truth, but uh, I guess there's a lot of articles you have to read. Once again, I digress. It's because we're at the end. I'm like feeling so yeah. celebratory already. It's like I'm going to throw my textbook out the window. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> All right, let me just share the different screen to show this demo real quick. Um, it's good. I think it's hailing outside. It's uh, oh so, no. So uh, yeah, really? now we're ending. I probably need to move my car. Well, yeah. it's just really heavy rain. 110 degrees here, man. So okay. So let's see. This is the um, what is this thing? This is just a demo of scalability using uh, synthetic data. And here we're going to turn on the parallel processing. Ooh. All right, get ready for that. All right. So apparently, I have 20 cores in this computer so I have no idea wow. so I just got this computer I mainly it's a gaming machine of course but um, I tried doing some deep learning on my this thing and it like got really hot and the, the UPS like complained that me I was drawing too much power <laughs> so I stopped doing that yeah I I've seen like I don't I don't really deal with this that much but like I've seen you know people that what they have to do to cool their their PCs so kind yeah. of do this type of like whether it's games or high level computing, you know, it's like, it seems like there's, that's a real issue. Yeah, exactly. All right, so the point here, he's just, uh, what he's doing here is gonna generate some fake data. Uh, so here's a slope and uh, intercept, I guess, right? Intercept, so a standard, uh, uh, this is do this, a, uh, turns out a logistic uh, regression example. Um, with, so here's Sigma, there's gonna be uh, 10,000 elements and a large number, 100 predictors but they're all just gonna be random. Um, actually, I think one of them is a predictor in the rest, yeah, so. The rest are noise. Yeah, the rest are noise. Yeah, that was the point of this thing, just to make it hard to fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so X, where's X? Oh, oh, good point. Is, yeah, X, okay. So X is the first column here, there's where X is set. He uses set names, okay. So you're just take, basically saying out of the 10,000. Yeah, out of the 100, no, out of the 100. Oh, 100, sorry, sorry. You're just saying the first one is, is yeah. noise, right? The, rest, the first, no, the first one, X is the only variable we care about. The other 99 are noise. That's what I meant, sorry, yeah. Yeah. All right, so that's the same idea. Did I run that? No. Uh, so now this is, this is actually a very quick little thing because he does it all at once. So he's going to fit it three ways, first with just GLM uh, in the standard way, and that'll take a minute. <laughs> so I better start. I better push play because it's going to take a minute. Uh, by the second, way, uh, well, well, this oh, is really by the way, look at this over here. So I guess I got out of my, I got four chains going at parallel here. So he's working through it. I'm pointing at my screen. You can't see, but this over here. I can, see, right? it. I can yeah. see it. Oh, my mouse is like slow now because it's cranking away. Okay. So I got uh -huh. four worker threads working on this uh, thing right now. That's where the first. Minute, one. So it, 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 it's 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 one fifty your time, right? Twelve fifty. Oh, is it three hours? I yeah. thought you were only. Um... You got. We don't do daylight savings time here. So. Oh, that's right. You're in Colorado, right? No, Arizona. Oh, why did I think? Oh, why yeah. did I think you were in Colorado? I don't know. What part of Arizona? Scottsdale, Phoenix area. Oh, I used to go to that year like, every year for spring training. Oh, well, that's hot. <laughs> well, that yeah. March is beautiful in March. You're a baseball fan? I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, no, I'm. Yeah, it's the Guardians slash Indians. They were. I've been going there for decades and I think you know now that's a great I love I love that oh yeah we have it we have a spring training here in Scottsdale now too big giant place now for it oh yeah there's come all come visit come visit yeah. man yeah well I have to I mean I, I I haven't been out for like three or four years but I have to yeah yeah give me a call man or ping me on slack all right so we did three things we did a standard uh DLM which is just this, you know uh maximum likelihood right and we did stand GLM with algorithm optimizing. This is that, uh, for, you know, just basically find the, the biggest posterior and then take the second derivatives. Uh, then we did a standard GLM. That's what took the longest. That was all this over here on the right, the standard uh, stand GLM. Uh, stand, I'm sorry, without, with the Monte Carlo Markov chain. Oh, look at this. We're using benchmark. Huh? There you go. Yeah. So we can see how long these things took. Uh, relative time, whatever that means. I guess we're doing so. The, the fastest is GLM. It's not doing much, right? It's, and then you can see that the stand GLM with the optimizing algorithm, it's about the same speed. 
market color markup chain, 44 times longer. So you can get a tremendous speed up if you're willing to give up uh, the accuracy of the posterior distribution. Is the point of that. And, but we can now see how well these did, right? So the most accurate should be probably uh, Stan GLM. So the order is um, GLM, uh, Stan GLM optimizing, and then the Monte Carlo markup chain. So in this case, it turns out that the full posterior doesn't really give us a lot, at least as far as the values, right? The, uh, yeah. you know, and we wouldn't expect that. The, the, you know, these all three are kind of just picking the same maximum posterior pop, uh, thing. And this has flat priors for the Stan GLM. In fact, the fact these are different at all is a little surprising, perhaps. You know, it's just something slightly different the way GLM does it uh, for that, right? Uh, we didn't look at the errors, but we should. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, but I'm not sure I do that really quickly because we're running out of time. Uh, exercise to the reader, look at the errors in that. Okay, <laughs> we go back. Um, I, I would predict I would predict that the errors are different, at least for GLM with the full posterior versus GLM with the approximation, because that is where the big difference is in the calculation of using the Monte Carlo Markov chain versus just using the Gaussian approximation. Um, all right, so. I do recommend, I, I probably will myself look at that later just to see how different that is. Yeah. What was I looking for? The other screen? Ah, oh, here it is. So that's basically the final chapter of the book. So that means we made it to the end. You did it. Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, and I, I, overall, I mean, we got a couple. I got like a minute. I just want to say, overall, I really enjoyed uh, working through this with you. I'm so glad. I appreciate you, Ryan, for sticking around <laughs> for the duration of this thing. It's um, hard to get people to stick around. That's for sure. I mean, we I started I, with a, a large never, and then right down. Yeah, it's. But yeah, no, I think it's important to, even if you know you don't. I mean, like yeah, this stuff is tough. You got to kind of like it's going to take multiple readings you know so sometimes even if it's you know you're not getting the deepest uh reading the first time through i think it you know it just you got to set the table you know and kind of just get some experience but yeah no i'm no worries it's been i'm, I'm ready for a break but i'm glad i did yeah, this me too sure me too, me too. Um, yeah actually let me just put the end thing on here I guess we, so we have done with the book club